Great. Um, so uh, today we're going to be continuing on our discussion of categories with Eugenia Chang's book, The um, Joy of Abstraction. And uh, specifically, um, we had uh, crossed that key threshold of chapter eight um, uh, two times ago. Um, uh, where we started to talk about the basic components of categories and and the data that makes them up, the structure that defines them, uh, so the identities and the composition, and then the axioms, the properties that that um, specify sort of well behaved. Um, uh, behavior when engaging in, in composition, uh, particularly in the form of unitality and associativity. Um, and uh, uh, last time we also talked a little bit about chapter nine, um, which was, uh, which provided a brief look at a set of items discussed in previous chapters. Uh, that were secretly, as she says, categories, right? Um, and uh, those included some things that we had discussed in greater detail, like equivalence relations. We noted its categorical side, factors, number systems, and symmetry. Uh, things just related to these symmetry groups. And, and and rotations. And you know, for each of these, she revealed that a topic she had covered in previous chapters has um can be framed categorically, right? Um can be framed categorically and uh that formed the basis for some of our discussion. Now she she introduced a notion in that that in that section, the very final page of chapter nine that we actually didn't talk about, and I, I came to regret it. Um, and that is this notion of a dual for a category. Does anyone remember that? Anyone remember where that comes up? Example, well, well, uh, yeah. With what example she introduces the dual? Uh, she talks about it in the, the number system at the end of chapter nine. I think. Are you understanding it? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, so it's it's you know in that context of number systems that um, she she first uh, first talks about it, and in this presentation, mm -hmm. number systems. She um, she provides a first sort of discussion of a categorical um, characterization of a number system, um, which it turns out to be just one of many, but um, one of three major ones that will be highlighted in these coming chapters. This this one is an ordering one. Uh, do you remember what the arrow meant for that number system? Less than or equal. Less than or equal. So if there was an arrow from A to B, it meant A is less than or equal to B. Remember that? Um, and she drew it out on page 116 towards the top in all its um uh in, in all its sort of uh glory. Um uh but it turns out that she also discusses in the previous section factors which are another thing that can be undertaken with natural numbers. And uh, it's coming up to, in chapter 11, a significant discussion of monoids, which are going to be a really important one for our purposes in applying these techniques to dynamic modeling for, for health, community safety and well-being, um, and, and uh, you know, applications of them in this in this uh, computational epidemiology sense. Um, monoids um, are going to provide uh, a lot of utility as sort of tools for thinking through a lot of the issues. And as we'll see, we'll have 
monoidal categories. And a lot of the constructs we're going to use in the context of, of, of computational epidemiology applications of category theory, we use symmetric monoidal categories, et cetera, which is a somewhat different notion, but the notion of monoid is going to figure prominently. Um, okay, so page one, 116, she introduces this notion of a uh, of dealing with the natural numbers with less than or equal to um, S relation. And she notes that if you draw them out with all the arrows, it's, it's horribly, um, horribly kind of complicated diagram. But then she notes what? How does she clean that up on page 116? Removes composite arrows? Yeah, she, well, she removes it. And so composite arrows is one big thing that she removes. From 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 this guy uh, here, um, or this gal maybe. Um, but uh, what else does she remove? Identity, things that are implied automatically, things that we know exist by the nature of the categorical definitions. We don't draw; they must be there. And the idea is that drawing them clutters thing unnecessarily. So she notes that if you if you take this sort of diagram and you 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 eliminate these um these were these visually redundant arrows, not logically but visually right these ones that are implicit they don't need to be drawn then you get something much nicer you get this this kind of long chain with you know, a link, uh, uh, a chain from from the object zero to the object one to the object two to the object three to the object four, et cetera, right? Um, note that the, the numbers here are objects, okay? This is going to be very important because for the monoids, as we'll see, the numbers are not captured in the objects. The objects are uninteresting. It's just one of them, and it means really nothing. It just provides this kind of infrastructure for the loops to capture on. The numbers were captured in the morphisms, which is really cool. And it's a really powerful idea, although it's one that makes you need to chew on for a while, typically. Um, but here, the numbers are the objects, OK? Zero, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and what does it what does it mean that you have an arrow from one to two there? What, what does that mean in like this chain that there's a you know, one to two? One less three to two. It's tidy. That's true. It's tidier. And but it also means one is less than or equal to two, right? Um we needed to draw that arrow from one to two to you know to communicate the structure because it isn't applied implied by any other of these arrows. By contrast. Why isn't there one from say one to three? Why isn't there an arrow directly from one to three? Because it is, yeah, it's a composite, it's implied, it's implied. It's, it is implicit, it, and why is it implicit? Why do we know that has to exist? What is it about this diagram? From, from what about this diagram do we know that it, um, that other arrow has to exist? Um, that arrow from, one to three. How do we know that has to exist? Mm -hmm. Because if it's a category, it has to have transitivity. Yeah, if it's a category, it, it has to have transitivity. So we know there's from one to two, and we know there's from from what? Complete the argument, two to three. So there must be one from one, one to three. And there's only, and I would argue, there's only one possible one. Why is that? We don't have to worry, oh, well, which one from one to three does does the composite go from? Why not? Because there's exactly one, one arrow between each pair. Okay, uh, so I like that idea. And you're close, but why isn't there, is there really exactly one arrow between every pair? Is there one between two to zero? Yes. Because it's a thin category? It's a thin category, and a thin category means there's either or one. Right, because there's no arrow from two to zero, right? There's no arrow from three to two. There's one from two to three, but not from three to two. 
Now, Eric's comment there, though, is going to point to a future thing where it turns out in this, in a total order, either there's an arrow from two to three or three to two. And I think that's what he was getting at. You know, that's any cool. unordered pair, there's ex there's exactly one arrow between them. One arrow in one direction. Yeah, it's it, but it's in a single direction. That's right. And if we consider, is there one from three to two? No, there's not, but there is from two to three. Um, yeah, so so that arrow from one to three is implied uniquely by the other ones. Right? There's no choice in which arrow it is. It's the arrow from one to three. So, so in other words, when we compose the arrow from one to two, one to two, and the one from two to three, um, we get the arrow. There ain't no choice in the matter. A single arrow from one to three. You comfortable with that? Okay. Okay. Um, now, this is, as we call it, a total ordering, and we're going to be talking about that, of course, um, this session for total orderings, right? In the, in the next chapter, chapter 10. But then she introduces the dual. And what's the dual here? Okay, it hasn't changed the structure in a, a deep way. It has the same information, right? And but but what's the clear visual sign that uh, the, we've introduced the dual? The arrows flip backwards. Arrows flip backwards. Yeah, they're flipped. They're going the opposite way, right? Um, and. So we have the dual of the category. You notice the objects are the same. There's no change to the objects. All we're doing is we're flipping the arrows. Now, this is a slippery concept uh, for many students, they, including myself. When I was first learning about it, I was, I was kind of confused about this notion. Um, it's uh, Eugenia Chang in one of those supporting videos that I Provided to which are provided like you know comments um that it's like when you take the dual of a category it's the same morphisms regarded as going the other way okay and and, and it it's not that they are different morphisms it's just they're the flip side of or the you know, it's like we talk about two sides of the same coin. It's like two sides of the same coin. Now, in this case, it may seem a little bit, um, a little bit con contrived, but, um, you know, uh, A is less than or equal to B if B is greater than or equal to A, right? You could say, well, it's, it's really the same thing. It's just flipping them around, right? And like, the side, like just visually flipping it around, right? Um, when 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 I had a teacher, I think this was in I don't know what grade, it was, second grade, first grade, or something, and then they taught me about a greater than or equal to b, right? Um, actually, they weren't thinking categorical, so um, they they introduced it with you know, for, for and they told me like with this slow. The dragon wants to eat the big, the bigger one. So its mouth is open towards the bigger one. So this means like A is bigger than B. The dragon like faces the bigger one and they want to eat it. It's an alligator for my teacher. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. It oh, has a little steam inside of the mouth. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, What's that? I did that, but I didn't have a reason. I just thought that looked like Pac Man. So oh, yeah. I just gave it to you. Yeah, I mean, wasn't uh, Believe it or not, space invaders and asteroids weren't around. Those were those were not yet. Um, those are not yet specs in the cosmic vehicle of an eye. Um, so so when we have this, you know, we could just as well you know, um, flip it, uh, flip it around, right? Um, and and basically say, you know, a B is less than uh, A, right? Or if this is less than A, we could put it like that, right? Um, and uh, 
you know, what's that? Um, uh, yeah, so, um, okay, so, so yeah, I won't, I won't uh, build on that, that comment right now. In any case, the, the point is you could write this either way, right? And so we could write it with this category where we have an arrow um, from A to B as indicating, ah, so now I'm going to screw it up. Uh, so B to A indicating that A is greater than, or, oh, sorry. Ah, okay, okay, uh, okay. Um, sorry about this. Um, right, uh, I could do either one. Um, if, if I say with the original category that she introduces, this means a, gosh darn it, um, duels get you all the time sort of this off thing. In any case, um, B is less than or equal to A. Yes, yeah, yeah. B is less than or equal to A, right? right? And then uh, we could alternatively phrase it as in the dual category, Right, um, going this way uh, from from A to B, where we have B, right, um, is greater than right. Um, so so from A to B, here the arrow means not A is less than or equal to B, but but A is greater than or equal to B, right? And so this is um, A. A is greater than or equal to B, right? Which is the same thing here, right? A is greater than or equal to B, right? So if this is in the, so in original category, original category, uh, arrow, arrow A to B, maybe I'll write it the same. Anyway, B to A, right? B arrow, I'll write X arrow Y. X arrow Y means X is less than or equal to Y, right? That's what she says, right? In the original category that she's describing on page page 115, right? Um yeah, there's an arrow from A to B given by B A is less than or equal to B, right? An arrow from X to Y if X is less than or equal to Y, right? Right? That only that's what that means. And the dual category, the dual category, um, right? Um, then, then an arrow. From and I'll use um, R to S, let's say, um, uh, means what? In the dual category, uh, an, an arrow from R to S means what? R is what? Greater than or equal to S, right? Mm -hmm. So, so here we have an arrow from. B to A, right? Right? And that means that, just read it off, B is less than or equal to A, right? In the dual category, if there's an arrow from R to S, that's from A to B here, right? Um, then, then R, A is greater than or equal to Right. So, so this is in the dual category. And you notice here that this is the same logical relation. Do you see that? Same. same information. It's the same information. A is greater than or equal to B, and this is A greater than or equal to B. Right. Mm -hmm. Just flips. Just flips. Right. Um. Uh. So. Uh, it's it's the same information that's being communicated, but there are other examples. This is a particularly sort of um, parsimonious or 
or or sort of limited category, um, or I shouldn't say limited, but it's particularly sim simple, um, uh, you know, austere category. Um, we might think about other categories, like this category of factorizations, right? And I could try to draw it out, but but it's better illustrated on uh, page. Where's where's her factor factors one? It's one. It, one uh, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, but but there's a there's a nice picture of the of the lattice earlier, right? Lattice of factors. What's up? So yes. Uh, last year I did a mathematical model, linear mathematical model. Yes. And within that course, we yes. discussed deriving the dual. Is this the same dual, just on like a different level? Probably, um, because, because the word dual has found its way to many areas of mathematics, yes. Um, I would love to know how they're using it in that class. So for, was this in stats? Like, no, this is for a math class, uh, okay. linear programming, linear modeling of mathematics. Oh, okay, so the, this is like linear so programming. Like optimization. Yes, of yes. Uh, yes, I think it's, it's and then it, like and it does like direct. Yeah, right, right. I mean, you turn some things into different yeah. things, some things. And, I, I just got really excited. Yeah, because I, was like, I, 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 I think this is correct. Well, even that eight down is going to be the same notion. Yeah. Uh, if if you were to represent it, no, if you represent it category. This would just be a significant left. I want I want to yeah I want to exactly I want to double check that, but I think that's the case. And yes, it comes up in a a lot of it pops out in a lot of other areas of math too, which is cool, right? Anyway, um, but here the dual has particularly no simple notion associated with it uh, about the meaning of the errors. And I want to point you to page sixty-two where she draws these um these diagrams of factors, right? And she comments um later in. I think it's in chapter nine um, about how uh, when we have factors, um, she notes that you can also yeah. So let, let's let's go to page one fourteen. So if you have that that lattice in mind of factors, you'll notice on page one fourteen, um, she says uh, she's. Preparing for this notion of a dual, I think. Um, so if you make this category with all the factors of 30 and arrows being indicate when A is a factor B, she says, we could also do this the other way around and say there's an arrow A, uh, arrow a going to B whenever A is a multiple of B, right? Um, and the information in the diagram will be the same, right? Um, it's the same information. Um, but it'll be depicted with the arrows pointing the other way, right? Um, turning the arrows around is called taking the dual in category theory. Um, so she she introduces it here and then she applies it in that next section on number systems, right? But in both cases, I think you can see it's the same basic information. Now, one thing that I, I got really fair about um, on this was when we had, like the category Hask on um, this pseudo category or quasi category for Haskell um, with types. Remember that? We had types as the objects and, and functions between types, like a function taking in a array of doubles and going to a double or something like that. Um, and it was a function. Um, or remember, we had the category of sets and functions. Remember these? Um, we introduced these uh, last time, right? Um, and uh, so I, I showed you this, uh, this one here, I think. Um, let me just call it, uh, call it up. Uh, so we'll, we'll go over here. And which screen are we? Nastar, which screen do you see? Do you see like? The screen with the slides. Do you see which, which uh, one? I can. I can just see you. 
Oh, okay, okay. Well, my condolences. Um, so let's let's go share a screen here. I'm going to try to share the big screen. So if I could only get my mouse back. Okay, uh, now we're really in trouble. My my mouse is mouse is uh, here gone. It went it went. There we go. Okay, let's let's go over here. Here we go. This is the big desktop. Right. Okay. Hey. Okay. Now, what's the topological relationship of these two screens? Ah, uh, here we go. There we go. Okay. And somewhere up here, there's a button. There we go. Can you see the slides, Nestoran? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Um. But we saw like this category of sets and functions. Remember that guy? Remember this guy with half, right? Where we have these types and we have functions between them. Um, or here where we have sets and functions between them. Remember that? We had to reason about for every element of the source set. Remember this is the definition of function math mathematic from a mathematical standpoint. To what element of the target set does it map? You know, two point three maybe maps to to false. Um, four point seven eight for false and minus four point one to true for the is negative when applied to this guy. Remember that. Um, so the thing that really confused me with the dual is that like, what what do you mean like? How is is negative? How how can you construe that as a function from false true to this set like two point three four point seven minus four point? I mean, it, it doesn't go in that opposite direction. Or similarly for this guy here, you know, in the quantity category for hasp, like is negative goes from float to bool. What do you mean you can interpret it as a function from bool to float? Until I found out later that oh. Guess what? The dual, the dual of this category, or, or, or either of these categories, actually, the dual of, of that function is not a function. It's a co-function. It's a wild thing. And we're not going to talk about it right now because it, it'll 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 be a fun thing to discuss it later. But but don't always think that when you take the dual. When you take the dual, the morphisms will, they'll have the same information as known as that. It's going to be the same information, but that doesn't mean it's the same. Like the objects are all the same, but the morphisms are not necessarily going to be the same thing. They may be originally functors and now they're co-functors or they're, they're functions originally like here and now they're co-functions. Um, and then it all makes sense. It's beautiful. Actually. It makes sense how they work. Yes. So then in terms of the, the reverse error, the, the dual error yeah. on this would just be the reverse mapping. So like on this negative, it goes from true to minus four point one, false to four point seven. Right. It's it's the same information that's in is negative. It's the same mapping, but going the other way. But it's not a function the other way anymore. It's it's what's called the co-function, mm -hmm. um, which has the same information on it that. False, and and I think I think the gist of it is I'd have to go back and remember it, but I think the gist of it is like true is mapped to from is is mapped to from minus four point one, and false is mapped to from two point three point four point seven. Right, and it can be a function proper because false maps to two to seven. Exactly. Okay, but it sense. can be a co function. It can be a co function, no problem. I mean, it's perfectly legitimate co-function. It just can't be a function. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. So don't don't get confused. Like the dual has to have if if the if the original category has the uh, has has you know objects sets and morphisms functions that the dual of the category has to have. You know, it will have the same objects, but it won't necessarily have the same type of morphisms. It could be the co of co functors or co functions, etc. Yeah, kind of, kind of cool. Um, so it turns out these are going to come up. These duals are kind of going to come up all the time. And I mean, 
so much that that they're almost going to be casually described. In fact, we're going to write it as op. Okay, so we're going to write like instead of writing set for the category of sets and functions between, we'll write set op over just op instead. That's the opposite of set, the dual of set. Or we'll write the fin set, the category of finite sets and functions, and we will write it as fin set op. Okay. Um, and in general, we have a category C, and it's our convention in category three, you write it with uh, with one of these curly sort of script things. Um, you write, if, if you want to take the dual, you write all. Okay. And that just means the dual of this category. Okay. Um, and this will come up on top. We'll use this, like, off will be appearing in many, 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 many places. Um, uh, and as Eugene and China later introduced, there's some uh, quite funny jokes um, for that. Uh, that come up with the co. Math category theorists take the word co very seriously. Um, um, co will be used to mean things related to the to the opposite of the category, or in other words, the dual of the category. Okay. Yeah. Could it be that only the only categories do have the behavior of the greater than or less than? I don't. I, and that's an answer it's too deep for me to answer right now i'm not i'm not i'm not sure i will say like um maybe that's maybe that's the case i'm 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 not i'm not positive maybe, maybe that's the case that uh, yeah all thin categories would seem to have it yeah yeah um although uh yeah, there, I mean, there are some that are kind of trivially thin, like they're discrete categories. Anyone remember what a discrete category is? That's actually talked about in chapter 11, I think. Um, yeah, she, she talks about it. So you're not expected to know this yet. Um, wait, does she? No, or, yes. Yeah, no arrows except the identity arrow. And and in discrete categories, yeah, I guess you could say they're thin because it's zero or one or zero morphisms between any pair of objects from you know from object A to A, object B. Um what's that? Uh, so yeah, if you have if you have exactly one morphism um between every pair of objects, then I think it's uh, um, exactly one morphism between any pair of objects, uh, I think will be required for a, for a total ordering. Um, but what you can't, then you can't have, um, yeah. Uh, 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 there, there it needs to be uh, conditions more than that, I think. But here, let, let's get to those ordered sets in a bit. But um, yeah, not got in way too late last night to, for me to be operating uh, dynamically. Yeah. Yes, you can have op of op, we'll be back to the virtual yeah. Yeah. If you So if you take C op, op. You get C. It's the original. It's it's the original um, category. So C op op is C. Just take the op. It's kind of like inverse. Yeah, it's like the inverse of the matrix. Something like something like that. It, as long as it's not singular. Yeah, that's right. Um, so duals will be will be actually a lot of fun sometimes, um, but they're they're kind of 
a slippery up there, so I'm trying to give you some rules here. So let's talk about ordered sets, categories with particularly tidy arrow structures. So what does she introduce in the discussion with ordered sets? In in what? One order. Okay, so yeah. So a totally ordered set is a category which for all objects A B, there's exactly one arrow between them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um and And how does that relate to the other type of order that she talks about here? What what is that? Partially ordered. Partially ordered. That's right. Mm -hmm. Partially ordered. Um, and which of them is the subset of the other? Full order is a subset of partial order. Full order is a subset of partial order. Toe to, to set is a subset of a po set. Yeah. Yeah, you have partial orders of, of these things. That's right. Um, and she shows some examples of partial orders, right? Um, so on page 120, um, you have this lattice uh, of divisors from of 30, right? This is page 120, right? This, this kind of uh, lattice there. So that lattice, why isn't looking at it? Why isn't that a toe set? Why is it only a toe set? What is it about that lattice? You can immediately see, you say, that's not a total order. What examples in there can you see that you know it's not a total order? <laughs> Remember the definition of a total total order. Total order has all objects have what? Exactly one. Error. Exactly one arrow. So for that that lattice, does it have exactly one arrow there? Uh, for example, three to ten doesn't have one. Yeah, three to ten doesn't have one. Um. Well, e e yes, I mean, there's a primary relationship between A and B where there's a, you know, uh, there's an arrow between them if A divides B. Right? Um, and you'll notice there are some of these, some A and B, pairs A and B, where there's no arrow between them, meaning A doesn't divide B and B doesn't what? Divide A, right? There's no arrows between them. So that's a partial order. Um, can you think of another partial order that we've seen? It was actually flashed up there in my, my slides just a few minutes ago, et cetera. The category of subsets. Subsets, yeah, yeah. So this guy here, right? Why isn't that a total order? Give me, give me an example that shows it's not a total order. Okay, but okay, uh, but what about the null set? Right, because the, the, the null set is a great one to think about, but I wouldn't say it proves. In fact, I would say here, for reasons that would be matters of some delight in this classroom and a few lectures or, or several lectures later, the null set. Does it have length to two? Does it have an arrow to zero? Does it have an arrow to one, zero, three? Does it have an arrow to zero, two, three? It has an arrow to, guess what? All of them. And how many such arrows does it have? One. It is what we call the initial object. It has an arrow to every other object. Mm -hmm. Is there a is there a number like this in this lattice, this here lattice? 
of divisors of 30. Is there a number like that that has an arrow to every other object? One has an arrow to, because it's the initial object in that category. Mm -hmm. It turns out there are these things called initial objects. Not all categories happen, but when they do, they're a matter of sublime beauty because they have a an arrow to every other object, but not just any old arrow. They have a unique arrow to every other object, a unique arrow. Um, and the null set, the empty set here, has a unique arrow to every other. Mm -hmm. Often it's kind of a, 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 a vacuous or a trivial one. It's like, yeah, of course there's one. Well, yeah, that's why it has to have everything else. It, it turns out it's like, often when you think about it, it's like, yeah, that's true, but it's kind of, you might think it's kind of boring, like one divides everything out. What about it? The empty set is a subset of everything. Yeah, yeah, but it's not that interesting, maybe. Um, uh, it, you know, that there's a mapping from the empty set to every other set that is vacuously true because you don't have to do any work. You know, if you if you if you say, is there a function from the empty set to any other set? The answer is yes, because it's vacuously true. There's nothing to map. So it's automatically the case. You don't have to do any work. It's like you don't even have to roll out of bed. It's like they are right. And, it, you don't have to specify anything to specify it. It just is like, it It just is in some ways that doesn't need any information. Um, you've done your work before you even started. Something like that. It's it's what it, in Haskell it's called absurd. The function is called absurd. It's like this mapping from the empty set to anything else or from, from the, uh, uh, from void to anything else. Uh, so, so uh, I had asked, is there an object which, you know, a pair of objects which doesn't have a link between it? And uh, Larissa figured out, yeah, that, that initial object has some fascinating properties. It's the initial object here. It's the most interesting object. One of the two most interesting objects in this whole diagram. I'll come back to what the most interesting is in a moment. Um, but what, what is it, um, uh, but, but is that an example of something that does not have a link to anything else? No, it has a link to everything, a unique one, one single link to everything. But give me a pair of objects which show that this is not a total ordering. One, two, and three. Uh, sorry, one, two, and... Zero to three. Yeah, is there a link from this to this? No, why not? Because this is not a subset of this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, and is that the only such one? No, they are legion. Like one, three, and two, three don't have a link between them, right? Because this is not a subset of this. And is this a subset of this? No, it's a partial order. It's a partial order. There's plenty of order there. There's plenty of structure there, right? There's plenty of things that are subsets of others, but not everything is in a subset relationship to everything else, right? Mm. Now, coming back to Larissa's brilliant signaling, uh, singling out of this initial object, What's, I said, this is one of the two most interesting objects in this category. What's the other one? The one on the top. And this is called, this is the initial object. Anyone want to guess what this is called? Good. It's called final or term. It's a terminal or final object. That's exactly right. Because it has, guess what? It has inner. From and it has an error from anything, but not just any arrow, a yeah. unique arrow, a unique arrow from everything. And when categories have initial and terminal objects, they're just, they're beautiful things. 
They're beautiful. And those will be what we call universal properties. We're going to see those coming up again and again and again. And for every category, or, you know, for the different categories, what what they are, it's going to be different, but they're they're beautiful, they're beautiful things that exist. And it turns out if they exist, there's also there's these nice properties and that you can um, uh, take advantage of. But those are what are called universal constructions. They're like every other object has an arrow from the initial object. Every object has a, a you know unique arrow from the initial object. Every arrow has a unique uh, I'm sorry, every what am I saying? Every object has a unique arrow to the uh, terminal object. Every object has a unique arrow from the initial object. Yeah. Okay. And if you take the dual and the terminal and the initial object to the spot places and the terminal becomes the yes. initial. Yes, yes, it's beautiful. Ain't that beautiful? Darn right. Um, yeah, so that's that's exactly right. Uh -huh. um, and these things will crop up um, in the context of our stock flow stuff, and um, it, it's going to be uh, quite quite beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean they they come up in areas relevant to to computational IP as well. Um, uh, okay, so. Um, so that's uh, that's good. Let me let me ask. Um, so she gives on page one twenty uh, a thing things to think about. She say she says from this from this post set partially ordered set here. Um, she says it might look like some pairs of objects with more than one arrow between them. For example, the two composites on the right. Can you see why there is only actually uh, there's actually only one arrow there? So she points out, hey, look, you can get from two to thirty through six, but you can also get to it through ten. So aren't there two paths from two to thirty? Aren't there two arrows from two to thirty? Why not? Why is that not the case? Because the different the two different composite arrows mean the same thing. They are the same. Yeah, what, they commute. I, you go either way; it's the same. The thing that I didn't understand about this is she was saying it with every or what she uh, I my understanding that she said every part of the order set has that property. Um, he says the uh, um whenever there is at most one error between any two objects in a category, right. All diagrams in a category must that's, commute. That's right. That's that's the case because. Because there's got to be, so if there exists, so so from so let's consider these paths, right? So pardon me. Whenever there is at most uh, at most one error between any two objects in a category, and then all diagrams in the category must commute. So if we have a diagram, um, we have this diagram where uh, we have two paths that converge on the same thing meaning they come from the same source, call it A, and they go to the same source, call it Z, right? They may go in many different ways, like one goes through B, C, D, and the other goes through X, Y, Z, right? Um, but they all get to Z. Because when there's at most one arrow be between any two objects in a category, um, uh, which is the definition of a partially ordered set, right? Um, if there's at most one arrow, then we know because there are these two paths, there's at least one arrow going from A to Z, right? Um, and we know in this category, whenever there's at most one arrow between any two objects, then we know that both of those, the fact that we can get from A to Z means there's, there's at least one arrow, but we know from the definition of the category, there's at most one arrow. So there must be the same arrow for me to set. It's like, we know there's one because we can get to it. Um, and we know there's, there's two ways to get to it. But remember the composite, this in a category, when you compose two paths, you have to pick 
what's the result of that composition? What's the composition rule you pick for a category? It says if you compose F and G, they're end to end arrows. So you have, you know, uh, maybe you have F going from X to Y, and you have G going from Y to Z, right? Um, the composite rule will tell you what's the particular morphism here from X to Z for composing G after F, right? Mm -hmm. um, so doing G after F or equally F big semi uh, G, right? Um, remember, uh, the part of the structure of the category is what is the composite, the rule for composing F and G? What, what morphism does it give you, right? And what I'm saying is that in an, in a category where there is at most at most where no up front there's at most one arrow between any pair of objects, which is what she says exactly here, right? Um, whenever there is at most uh, one object between two any two objects in the category, um, then we know that okay, there must be from the rule com composite. There must be some morphism that's the com composite, and that morphism must go from what to what? X to Z. X to Z. Um, and so there's no choice in the matter of which one it is, it's that there is one from X to Z. Now, it turns out that if you have another, another path, let's suppose from, uh, from X to W, and this is called H, and then another one from W to Z called J, right? Um, then we know there, there has to exist uh, a composite that's J after H, right? Right? There, there has to, but by the rules of a category, for any two end to end arrows, there has to be a composite. And it has to go from the source of the first to the target of the other, right? So we know there's one for J after H, right? For this one here. And what what does that go from? That composite goes from what? X to Z. But we know by what we posited about this category, there's only one going from X to Z. So it has to be the same error. There's no choice. So then could we, could we have an identical looking diagram, except we don't say there's exactly one arrow to be each and then yes. it doesn't mute? Correct. Okay. So, so if we have a category that has this and we don't specify that um, there's at most uh, one, one morphism between any two pair of objects, at most one arrow, um, if we don't specify constraints needed to make it unambiguous, in general, this will not commute. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it, it, it's a beautiful thing when it commutes. It's a nice thing when it commutes. We'll try to prove sometimes that it commutes. And if we construct our category so that it does commute, that will be extremely powerful for us. Um, and one way would be is if we have thin categories um, where we have zero or one, we know that there's zero or one from X to Z. This is showing there's at least one. And so we know this one has to be the same. And this, this is gonna, this is again, something which confused me a lot when I first started. I'm still learning category theory. This is something that confused me quite a bit when I first started learning category uh, theory, this um, this notion of sort of what's wrong, what's what's implicit, and and what's not. It turns out that this issue of presenting categories. Now, I may be using at risk of using sometimes uh, wrong words like presenting a category. Um, uh, there are things that you can deduce from it that um, are very powerful. And uh, you've got to realize when you draw it out, it's not just any slapdash drawing out of a, of, a, of a diagram. We're actually 
by what you're showing and you're not showing, you're you're actually laying out some very important information. So I'm going to draw a category here. It's going to look like this. Okay, it's going to have two objects, mm -hmm. which, which, as she says, we'll assume since we don't say they're the same that they're different. I'm going to have F and G, and what things do you know exist, but I'm not trying? Okay. Yeah, so there's secretly some identities, right? A, right? This is the identity morphism. There can be plenty of morphisms in other categories. There could be plenty of morphisms from an object to itself that are not identity, but, but I'm saying, because I didn't draw it, you know that there's, for every object, you know there's an identity morphism. I'm just going to violate the normal convention and draw it, okay? So this is, let's call this this guy here, let's call it uh, A and this guy B, okay? By the way, in category theory is very common to use like A and B and X and Y and Z for like the objects and F and G and H and J for the morphisms, okay? Ooh. So, so here we have these ideas. This is this is like ID on A or ID on B. Okay. And I think often these are drawn like these are written like one A and one B. That, that's another way to set of seeing ID. Okay. So if I have this, what does it tell me about F and G? If I have a category like this. And I'd say this is the presentation of my, my category. This is a, a drawing of a, of, a, of a category. And again, I may be using not quite the right words for it, but if, if I say this is my presentation of my category and I'm not writing anything else, what does it tell me about F and G? They're inverses of each other? Yes, they're inverses of each other. They have to be. Why do they have to be? You're not adding the same object as you compose them. Yes. So if you compose G after F, right? G after F, that morphism will go from where? A. From A to A. A, right? And how and what morphisms are there from A to A? There's only the identity. And here's the thing, there's only, I didn't draw one other than the identity. And that, in fact, I, I only drew the identity just to give you an idea. Because I didn't draw it, that's significant. There is no other morphism from A to A. The it only is. morphism from A to because I didn't draw it, I'm gonna, you know they're there, so I'm gonna pick it right? Um, this is A and this is B. Um, you know they're there though. Because I didn't draw it, we know there's no other, we know there's no other morphism from A to A. Could we specify for this diagram that it is exactly one for at most one error between them? No, we didn't we didn't specify that. And then we don't have to assume it. Either. It's just this cannot be anything but identity because we didn't draw one. If we had drawn it, all bets are off. If we had drawn it, if we had drawn a H, then these two could be H or they could be identity. And we don't know which it is. But if I don't draw this, the only morphism from A to A is what? Well, oh, well, it is GFF, which is, it must be identity because every one of these has it. And so this is saying actually that G and F are inverses, that if we do J, G after F it equals identity on A. And what does it further tell us? Same about G. Or F after G. Is F after, after G. G. That's right. Um, is, is, is one of these. Yeah. So, so this is saying these are inverses of each other. For example, these could be isomorphisms. Um, uh, so, and in fact, this category is called isomorphism. Uh, say A and B are isomorphic. 
um, given one, you can get the other losslessly um, converted back. I'm still a little bit confused about what you were saying about drawing this drawing the identity arrows. Mm -hmm. So don't we normally not draw Correct. them? Correct. But then in this case, we actually do but they're implied. Right. Uh, okay. So then how can we know for sure that G after F is 1A if there is also an identity arrow? Can it be some other no, 1A is identity? Um, yeah, but I mean, like, uh, couldn't could, there be another one? Yeah, like, couldn't we have the implied 1A arrow that we haven't drawn and then F or G after F equals some other morphism? No, because because we didn't draw another morphism, that means it's absent. So, so in other words, any morphism, any morphism, so I don't draw identity on A, but I have to draw if I want to say it's part of this category. I, any other morphism from A to A, I would have to draw. Okay. For it to be for it to be present. So if I draw this, we can't we can't do this. In other words, the identity very is not just any old morphism from A to A. It's the specific identity, right? Um, that if I compose it, if if I have an identity morphism here and I compose it with F, I get what? X, right? If I do G and then the identity morphism, I get what? G, just, just G. Yeah. Um. So, so that's a very special morphism on A. If I had another morphism A here, um, you know, that's I have to draw it when I draw this category for the presentation. So the reason for that is that there is uh, an actually drawn arrow from A to A via G after F. And because there is that arrow, we have specifically mentioned that it's not the identity if we want that to be the case. Well, if if I draw another Marcus smear, call it F, call it A. Um, now, F after G after F, we know by the rules of composition, we know G after F is going to go from the source of F, that's A, to the target of G, right, which is A. So whatever this is, G after F, it has to be something going from A to A. But here, there's two such things. What are those two such things? Uh, G after F and H. Well, well, no, it's not that it's G after F. It's it, There's two morphisms from A to A here. Uh, one is this one H, one is this one identity on A. Those are both present. And any on A is, 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 is one that's always present here, yeah. just don't draw it. So the two morphisms from A to A here are identity on A and H. We, we drew H, we know that it's, it's present. And so then this, we can no longer state this. If this category had been like this, we can no longer make this assumption because G after F could be H or it could be uh, identity. And there's just not enough information to determine it anymore. We'd have to write something. I can tell, I can tell you're, you're uh, uh, getting some questions here. Maybe I'll, I'll show another example sure, and we'll yeah. come back to this. Um, um, Hmm. Uh, right. Hmm. So suppose I have the category. Um, suppose I have a category here and I have, so if, if I have a category just with a single object, what do we know about the number of, what's the number of objects in this category? It's not a trick question, one. What's the number of morphisms? One. And what's that single morphism? Yeah. Um, by the way, this object is often called SAR, meaning like, I'm not even going to give it a name because it's like the only one there. Okay. Um, so, especially the SAR. It's a SAR. Yeah. It's the <laughs> same thing. It's the only thing. So, commonly, it's called SAR. Um, now, if I had morphism F, here. Um, mm, so I'm going to draw a morphism. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, mm, um, right. Uh, so, if, so F goes from what to what? Star to star, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. If I square F, if I apply F, can I apply F after F? I can, right? Because it's end to end, right? Star to star, star to star, right? What do I get back? What are the two possible things I could get back? What what it, remember if I if I compose it with itself, if I I take the com composition of F after F, can I do that? Yes, I can, because they're end to end, right? If I do this, what are two possible values this could be? What's one possible value of composing this with itself? Remember, remember the composition, the, the rule for composition for a category needs to tell you for any two end-to-end -end morphisms, if I compose them, what I get back. What are what are what what's one value I can get back? Yes, one star. Identity on this this uh up. remember the identity ones. It's there, right? It just don't run, right? What's another thing that I could get? So that's one possibility. It could be this. What's another possibility? So it's either, it's either, I'm telling you, this is ambiguous as to what the com composite is. Um, it's either this or it's what? Or it's F. It's either you, you You compose it with itself and you get back itself. That's all. Okay, no, I think I'm thinking about specific detail. Really, remember that the cat, the, the object is not. So, in my mind, I'm thinking of okay, uh, say star is instead of natural numbers and f is square, then you could do f after f, and that wouldn't be an identity, but it would be because you're still in natural numbers. Is that correct? Um. So, so here, um. If you had f at square, right? Going from natural numbers to natural numbers, right? Um, uh, now, okay, so so there you have a set natural numbers. And if f were a morphism, it were a, a, a morphism in sets and functions is a function, right? And let's suppose this is square, right? Okay. Um, so if we had a uh, square as a function, right? Um, then, yeah, so, so this is not a presentation, a full presentation of this category. This is, this is it would be incorrect to say that the category of, of, of a single set representing the naturals in this morphism square, that this is a, a a diagram of it because there's going to be another morphism that's going to be what yeah. quadratic. So yeah, it's going to be uh, I don't know square or square, right? Um, where this is composed with itself, and and so it's going to be I'll write it this to the fourth. I'll I'll, I'll call this this to the second or something like that. And then there's going to be another one, which is this to the A and this to the six. And so this category would give you actually um, a huge number of different composites that are that are different. This category. So what I'm what I'm trying to imply is like the presentation. I'll be with you in just a second. What is it? The presentation of the category, the drawing of the category contains information. And sometimes it's unique enough that the fact that we haven't drawn yet enemies and there's no other loops from, from this, no other self loops from A to A here is telling us there are no other morphisms from A to A beyond the identity. 
There's no other morphism for the self morphism. So there's no other self arrows from A to A beyond the identity. Is what, is, is what this is saying. This one is saying there's no other morphisms from this object star to itself beyond um, the identity, which is always here, and F. But it's it's un, it's still ambiguous because we haven't said which of these is this. This is not fully specified. We know it has to be one of these. But it could be this one, this first one, where F is its own inverse. Or it could be this one where F, so if this is the full, if this is the full presentation of this category, this is showing all the morphisms from the subject to itself, except the identity, which is always there, then it's it's still ambiguous because it doesn't tell us if F after F would give identity or F after F would give F. So if I wanted to make this precise, if I wanted to get it, make it unambiguous, I would need to show this and I would need to say F after F equals identity um, here. That would be a full presentation of this category that would be unambiguous. It would completely specify it. So are you saying that say this? Are you saying that composite arrows then have to equal another yes. arrow? Yes. Okay. Yes. So then, yes, then in the case of the subset, then the composite the arrow, arrow has there there has to be a composite arrow that you say when I compose F G after F, it must be some particular arrow from X to Z. Here, there's some so there's some collection of arrows here from X to Z, right? Sequence zero one for for a thin category, but but. Um, there's some collection of arrows, and I have to say, when I compose G after F, which particular arrow from Z, from X to Z is there? Which particular arrow in the HOM set, if this category were called C, which particular arrow in the HOM set XZ, the, the, the Z, sorry, um, I, I flew in at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still on the plane. The plane. Oh. So it goes from X to Z, right? Um, and uh, and there's some particular arrow, and I have to say, the rule of composition has to say which particular one it is. So this rule of composition, um, it, this is ambiguous, right? I don't know if composing this with this gives the identity on star, or if it gives F. Because both of them are candidates for what could be the composite. Here, it's exactly specified because I know it has to give G after F has to give some morphism from A to A, and there's only one. And what is it? It is the identity. So then, is the one with X, W, X, Y, Z, is that one fully defined? Or like, do we need to specify? No, no, it's not fully defined unless you told me it's a thin category. Okay. If, if you told me it's a, if you told me it's a thin category that, that there's there only exists um, between any two pair of arrows, the hump set is at size zero or one. There's only zero or one morphisms between those, um, between any pair of objects. Any pair of objects, there's only zero or one morphisms. Then this would be. Um, this would be unambiguous uh, in the sense that we know J after H must be the same as G after F. Yeah, from the definition of saying that it's a thin category. That from the definition of saying it's a thin category. If I, if I didn't know that it's a thin category, um, then I, I couldn't say that because these two could compose the same as this or they might not. Okay, that makes sense. I and if if you if you didn't want it to impose that it's a thin category, but you you want to say this particular case is, you could write a, what's called a, um, this this indicates that it commutes a, a little sort of um, a little loop, or you could write this like a check mark, um, meaning that this commutes. And and that would say, okay, J after H is the same as G after F. Even if 
it wasn't the thin category in general, this particular diagram we use. And that's going to be really big. We're going to see tons of cases where this is the case directly relevant to um, uh, to the uh, computational epidemiology stuff. So we're going to see it when we stratify stock flow models, for example. Um, we're going to see this, it's, and it's, it's beautiful. When we compose stock flow models, there's going to be commuting diagrams, and those are going to be really, really important. So often we will say, like, this commutes, um, and that will be communicating something really important about it. Um, it, it's communicating something about the structure of the system that no matter how you go from X to Z, it has the same morphism. I don't know if that's helpful. That's yeah. very helpful. Yeah. yeah. This this is stuff that took me a while to under understand. I I should have waited to take the scores from the site. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Or, or better, like a zillion times better, take it from Eugenia. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I'll take a picture too. Yeah. Yeah. Um it, you know, if you're if you're finding yourself getting some sense of this, you're doing really well. Like these these ideas take take some time. And and remember, he hasn't even discussed all these distinctions yet. You're gonna start to see these more. I'm kind of preparing you for additional chapters here. Okay. Um Okay, and, and speaking of that, we're we're getting close to well, we are really at, at time here. What I'm gonna try to do, I'm trying to take all these photos of my my you know hideous creations on the board. Um, and I will post them to the so course site, okay? Um, so that you have a record of this. Okay. Um uh, any final Questions before you know we we just talk about um, uh, the the next step here. Questions? Just uh, one question. Um, she said the process is not about subset of the process. Yeah, yeah. And um, is it my understanding? Uh, my understanding is in the process and uh, can uh, compare. Any two objects we can compare. That's right. Either there's a in the post set. That's right. In a post set, you'll have um, in a post set, you may have pairs of objects that are. And I'm not sure. Uh, pairs of objects where there's neither an arrow. So we consider a, a, a pair of objects A and B here. Um, say this one and this one. There's neither an arrow from this to this, nor an arrow from this to this, right? Um, so we can't really, there's no relation between, between them, but we can't compare them, right? Whereas with a, a toe set, there always is exactly one, either it's from this to this or this to this. So um, I think I have here, yeah, like this is a total order, right? That's a total order. Is this a partial or total order? This is divide. Um, uh, yeah, this is division. It's a partial order, yeah, because there's none between two and three, for example. Two doesn't divide three, and three doesn't divide two, right? Um, yeah. Um, by the way, this is a presentation where we say all of these are commuting, right? They're, 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 they're all, all of these commute. Um, so, uh, so yeah, a toe set would have every one of them has either an arrow from A to B or B to A. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for next time, what are you feeling about, oh, I did post uh, a take-home exercise, which involves reasoning about functions. That's going to be really important for us in chapter 12. But, and I want you to get a, a start in it. But 11, we're going to go into this issue of drawable categories and also talk about these cool, cool things that are monoids, um, where the natural numbers, they encode the natural numbers, but here's the thing, they encode the natural numbers, not as objects anymore, like this, where, where each object is a natural number, but instead where the natural numbers are encoded as morphisms from star to star. And like adding two of two natural numbers 
is achieved by composing the Mornings. And that's a wild idea. And it took a, it took a long time for me to get it through my thick skull. But um, it's, it turns out it's super powerful. And she calls it this one of these elements of um, sort of shift in dimensions, which give extra flexibility. Uh, so we're going to be talking about, about these monoids. Also, they're going to be sort of really start to grapple with them in that chapter 11. And then she's going to be talking about this thing called topologies, okay, topological spaces, which is really cool, quite new to me in its details, but um, uh, will, will again be something that's quite relevant to us, like when we're dealing with agent-based modeling and, and sort of wandering in space and that sort of thing. Like a, a, a um, monoidal, oh, sorry, a, a toroidal space and topology where you can go an agent that goes off to the right, comes around to the left, right? It's like a world where you can go around the circle Right, Tony was talking about this, right? Like a donut, right? A bagel. Last night I was traveling. Bagel, have bagel, will travel. And and you can go around the bagel this way and come back, or you can go around the bagel that way and come back, right? It's a toroidal space. It's like a big donut or a bagel. Um, and that's an example of kind of a topological space. It's about the connectivity of the space. And if we're dealing with HMA's models, that, that will be very useful to talk about. And we'll be, we'll just be introducing the, the um, notions, some basic notions, which are pretty cool. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Chapter 11. Chapter 11. Chapter 11. Yeah. Thank you for bearing with the situation. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, yeah. Uh, take care of that. Bye-bye. Oh, there we are. Thanks, Nastaran. Enjoy your Thank time. Thank you, Dr. Osby. Thank you. Okay, enjoy Bye. your time Bye. in Edmonton, eh? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Tony, take care of that. And let's see if I can find the mouse. How do I find the mouse? There it is. There's the mouse. Mm -hmm.